Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our nurses event tonight. I'm so excited to have you all join us for the Maker Health Showcase. I am Dr. Danielle McKamey. I am the founder, CEO, and president of DMPs of Color. And our mission as DMPs of Color is to build community and create opportunities for nurses of color through networking, mentorship, and advocacy to increase diversity in doctoral studies, clinical practice, and leadership. And it is my huge honor and pleasure to introduce the Maker Health team. So I will pass the mic to Anna and Rose. Thank you, Dr. McCammy. We are so thrilled to be here. Um, we've had just a really great partnership with DMPs of Color. Uh, my name is Anna Young, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Maker Health, and we are dedicated to bringing prototyping tools and training to clinicians at the point of care. So our dream is to see reinvent how health technology is made by giving you the tools to create it. So one of our incredible team members is also here. I'll pass to Rose. Hi, well, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Rose Hedges and I'm the Nursing Research and Innovation Coordinator at Unity Point Health St. Luke's Hospital in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And I run our nurse-led innovation lab in the hospital. Awesome, and I also want to um, pass the mic to one of our DMPs of Color advisory members, who's also uh, a Maker Health inventor, Dr. Gallegos. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Julian Gallegos. I currently work at Purdue University in Indiana, um, the DMP program director as well. Um, got involved with Maker Health in September of last year, gone through some several prototypes which I'll be sharing with you this evening and answering any questions that you might have specifically to Maker Health and how, the, how nurses can become innovators and in helping the community at large. Awesome. Um, so we are, when Danielle and I were brainstorming about what we could do together for Nurses Week, when one of the things that immediately came to mind was being able to share stories with you all from our team about what health making looks like. Um, so again, as I mentioned, like our, our mission is to bring the tools to you so that you can bring these ideas to life. So tonight, we invited Julian and Rose here as two key makers in the work that we do uh, to share their story and to explain firsthand. So I'll just kick it off and give you a quick kind of like to set the stage of some vocabulary that you might hear so that it's not um, this feels and, and, and you kind of know what you're hearing. So when we talk about health making, what we're describing are the things that you can hold in your hand that you have made at the point of care or modified. These can sometimes be small moments of ingenuity where you found materials in the supply closet to solve a challenge. Or this could be looking at a challenge and really re reinventing something. So you know, some of the most common materials that we hear the nooshes are using, tongue depressors, tape, scissors, you name it, and figuring out how to make patients more comfortable and safer in their environment. Um, so we look at those moments of ingenuities and then really try to help you think about how can you go from what was tapping into the hospital supply closet to tapping into the same tool sets that engineers use every day. Things like 3D printing, things like mold making, using different silicones and resins in really taking those moments of ingenuity at the bedside to the next level. So that 3D printing and the mold making is what we call a prototype. So that is that idea that keeps you up at night, that conversation you've had in the break room with your, with your colleagues or that napkin sketch that, you, that you've drawn um, of an idea that you have 
a prototype is when that comes to life in a physical form. And the teams that we work with, what you'll hear is they go through multiple prototypes. You never, when you're starting to create your idea, it never is perfect on the first, on the first try. So that's what a prototype is. And you get through those iterations of prototypes by experimenting, by testing, by trying. And, you know, it's Jeff Bezos said this, if, uh, you know, it's not an experiment if you know it's going to work. That's a quote that I love because it really is true. Like a lot of times what we do in health making is think about, well, what are we going to learn by trying this? And sometimes you can probably think of a million ways that it will go wrong or that it won't work or why it's not a good idea. But instead of sitting there and trying to convince yourself out of this crazy idea or this approach, try it. It's an experiment. So I'll just, I'll, I'll set the stage with those. Health making are the things that you're creating that you can hold in your hand, no matter how big, no matter how small. Prototype, when you see that idea come to life, leveraging new tools and technology to kind of to amplify that. An experiment, trying something to move it forward, to move the ball forward when you don't know if it's going to work or not. So that's the backstage. Now I'll get you to the really exciting part. Um, so we're going to start the way we structure, we're going to structure this evening is to allow uh, Julian and Rose to share uh, parts of their story. So they'll each get to talk um, for five to seven minutes to introduce. They've got pictures to show you. Um, and then from there, we'll kick it off. Um, Danielle and I have a few questions that we'll ask them just to to kind of put a little bit more context around that, but we would love to hear from you. You came here tonight on your nurses week. Um, and so we would love for this to be, for you to get out of this, what you would like. Um, so hopefully you have questions, throw them into the comments and we'll make sure that, um, that everybody sees them. Um, and hopefully we'll have a lot of fun. So with that, I'm going to kick this off and Julian pass the mic to you. Sorry, I was actually I have a picture that I want to share with you that I remembered I had in a little journal that I have here. So prior to um, joining academia, I actually worked as a nurse practitioner in different different settings, um, stroke care inpatient, endocrinology, diabetes. Um, and my last clinical position I actually worked in urology. And while working in urology in the outpatient setting, um, I had patients, several patients who actually had chronic indwelling urinary catheters. Um, some of those catheters were our, our typical urethral catheters, both men and women, but I also had a super pubic catheters. And a lot of my patients used to have difficulty with, especially with the super pubic catheters, not only at the point of insertion over the os, but also um, with the anchoring of the um, catheter to the leg. And as we know, as nurses, there's tons of different anchoring devices out there for catheters, but they still don't seem to work very well. Surprisingly enough, I used to have a lot of patients who would come in with their own devices that they had created to try to anchor these things. Um, I had one gentleman who used to use a, it was almost looked like a gasket, which was like, a, it, it was, um, foam that he put around the, after the insertion of the catheter, he would put it around the os. And what it, that did was to help create some rigidity to the um, insertion side a little bit to prevent it from bending. Um, because when it bent, when the catheter would bend at the point of insertion, oftentimes he, especially at night, pressure would be created in the bladder because it would just fill and it wasn't emptying into the cath, into the bag. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't getting out into the actual um, catheter itself and into the tubing and into the bag. So by doing this, he actually prevented the catheter from actually bending significantly at night. The other thing he would do is he used a lot, he used um, uh, yarn and all kinds of other types of, of string to help keep it in place. Um, and I thought there's got to be a, a, a better way to, to, to do this. So my first um, I'm gonna show you, let's see if I can share slides with you. 
So in, uh, in September of last year, um, Holly approached me about Maker's Health and asked me if I would be willing to participate. And I said, yeah, definitely. And then I had conversations with Nick, who is a, uh, one of the Maker Health um, engineers. And he and I have been working on different um, ideas for prototypes. Uh, I'm sharing a whiteboard here, hold on. Can you see that now? So this is my original idea. Um, it came from a drawing, the point of insertion, having some sort of anchor closer to, uh, to the abdomen, and then an anchor at the point of our, where we commonly find um, most anchors, which kind of lie on the thigh area of, of the patient. Um, I, I drew, drew some other things that I thought might work. Like I was, I was looking at maybe possibly like a button like device to help um, reduce the, the flexing or the, the uh, bending of the tube at the point of insertion and having that go around. But then I, I started to think of all these things of like, well, how do we do that? Because it's done, technically it's supposed to be done in a sterile, with a sterile field, blah, blah, blah. Um, and as Nick and I started to talk more and more, a lot of the conversation led to us thinking outside the box and thinking more of, you know, I want to do all of this, but how about we just focus on one certain piece first and then, and then move on to the other pieces that I was kind of envisioning in my head. So this is the next um, slide I have. And so after that drawing, Nick and I, Nick sent me a whole bunch of different um, uh, resources and materials for me to try to work and figure out what a prototype would look like. Um, he sent me the the duoderm, which and a, he actually sent me a um, uh, condom catheters, which kind of have like a nipple at the end. And so, for the point of insertion, I initially was thinking of, can you see my curse? My cursor. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, I was thinking of of a dressing with this nipple sticking out of it. And underneath, eventually there'd be an absorbent pad here because the other problem that patients with super pubic catheters are explained is, especially the active ones, is that it leaks and it does, it can leak around the os and it actually get on the clothes and then obviously they smell like urine. So I was thinking of putting some sort of absorbent pad eventually underneath this area here, which is if this was the, you know, the abdomen, the os, the, um, would be right here somewhere. The catheter would, would go into the os, out, flex around on the abdomen, and then down to the, to the leg and an anchor down here. This was a 3M piece that he sent to me. These are the, like the 3M um, things that you find in the store that you can actually um, anchor things with. And that was kind of my first prototype. Then we met again um, and we talked about how could we, how, how could I improve that after you kind of saw what my prototype looked like. We talked about more specifically, like I mentioned, the anchoring portion of, of the um, device. And we came, he actually, we actually talked for quite a while and I sent him pictures of what I thought it should look like. Because a lot of problems with the catheter is that it actually has difficult, when you put it into these devices that anchor, the problem is that it slides back and forth. And so I told him that I would like to find a device that actually had some sort of nubs or something on the inside on this, inner, on this inner portion to help increase friction, but not enough that it would tear the catheter if it was pulled, um, but just enough, you know, if you kind of like a, fi a finger trap. So that way, you know, it would, it, it had some leeway in both directions. So he, um, I sent him some pictures and, and he suggested um, some ideas, and he actually printed this out for me, which is this little um, white device here, which actually, if you were actually to see this on the inside, there are, um, if this was horizontal, there are horizontal lines or nubs of extra plastic that kind of look like bumps on the inside that help reduce um, friction, would help reduce the friction of a catheter. This is an example, I, we couldn't get catheters and surprisingly enough, working in acad academia, we do have a simulation lab, but my simulation lab folks are, they hold all the equipment to their heart and they do not let anything go. I was like, can I have a catheter? 
Um, unfortunately, I'm not working in a urology office anymore. So um, I don't have easy, easy access to, uh, you know, even uh, old um, obsolete or expired catheters. So I use this as just an example of what it would look like. So when he sent me more material, he not only sent the printed uh, piece of this, but he also sent me, um, he's like, how about a, a bottle nipple? That might actually improve the rigidity of this piece here. So I, I, I worked with that. But then again, we, like I said, we talked about more focusing on this and eventually coming to the, the, the little um, device that's going to go around the, evo the os of the uh, insertion site eventually. So the black represents the catheter as it goes into the os, comes around the abdomen. Usually the best way to curl it to do for, um, to help it drain is actually curl it around near the abdomen. And then eventually, obviously putting the, um, the um, anchor device somewhere near the thigh again, upper thigh, mid thigh. So I was able to actually um, use this, but unfortunately the biggest concern was at this point was it was still sliding back and forth. So I added this piece here, which is like a little, um, almost like a donut. So you'd put it around the actual catheter. So it'd allow it to go up, but it wouldn't allow it to pull down because most of my patients have actually used to say, the biggest problem is when it gets pulled downward um, because it, you know, you pull it downward and it pulls from the insertion site and that balloon gets put, pushed up, up against the um, bladder wall and it hurts really bad. So um, this allows it to, to go upward, but it doesn't allow it to, to be pulled downward. Um, so I went from um, a, a little um, a bandage here in this picture here to actually applying the little the duoderm over it to see if it anchor um, best. Then I was like, you know, a lot of time this duoderm and these different types of materials actually can oftentimes will cause um, irritation to the skin. So I thought, well, we already have devices kind of like this one here. What if we use something like a, a leg band um, and actually a, and, and put this anchor on the leg band um, as a way to prevent um, skin irritation or breakdown? So I did that. And this is my latest prototype. But we've had other conversations recently um, about this prototype and actually putting it on a elastic band, which I'm working on right now. And actually, I'm thinking about putting a um, so imagine this being an elastic black band or whatever color um, and under attached to this device on the other side, on the, on the, on, on the underside is actually a, like a button. Imagine just a big coat button underneath. So that way you can actually, and then what I plan to do is eventually cut a slit so you can actually thread that button in. And this device here can have ability to move back and forth um, on the actual band itself. So Nick and I are working on that next. Um, I, need to, I need to put it together so I can send him pictures because he, he, we did discuss the 3D printing of this um, because obviously we can't put buttons on the end of these things if it eventually becomes a, a something that's useful. So you know there, we could create something that looks like a button attached to um, the original anchoring piece underneath um, to allow it to move back and forth on the on the um, on the band here as the patient has it on their leg. So that's kind of my my um, my prototyping thus far. It's been fun. Um, Anna and I spoke um, last week, and I, I did mention I wish I had a lot more time to devote, but I will this summer because I'm not I, well. I'm teaching one class, so I have a lot more time to devote to getting this moving forward. I love that. Thank you, Julian. And it's, I mean, it's extremely helpful even for me to hear just how you thought through all the details of all these and how, and in the evolution of your thinking of um, like one of the big takeaways that I got is that, you know, being able to decide um, how to scope your project and like coming in with like a very well articulated challenge and then recognizing that you don't, in order to make an impact, you don't need to solve the, the whole thing that you originally identified. There's probably other really interesting and impactful ways. And so that was really neat. And I love the button design and 
the use of the baby bottle nipple. It's just, that's great. That's a lot of fun. Um, and we can't wait for the summer. It's going to be yeah. good. There's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of prototyping. Um, so we'll, um, Rose, let's jump in and allow you to share some of, um, just your background, your experience, both in nursing and DMP and, um, and health making. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, I'm going to share just a little bit on my background. I started nursing in a med surge for um, general medical unit and then um, jumped into ICU and did that for several years. I did that PRN. Is my screen sharing okay? Or does it look all crazy? Like it looks it a, little, a little off. How about that? Is that better? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. So while I was working in the ICU, um, I was always kind of a tinkerer, you know, fixing this or that. Um, one thing that I was kind of known for is with our trach patients, um, fresh trachs right out of surgery commonly would honk off the vent if it was very positional. I was always like, let's grab, let's grab a washcloth and let's wad it up and tie it this way and prop it this way and, you know, help the vent not honk off. And so I was always kind of tinkering with stuff. And through um, my studies getting my DNP, I found myself working with Maker Health and studying innovation and fast forward really fast, um, opening a medical makerspace in our hospital. So this is our makerspace and people often say, well, what do you do during the day? What does that look like? And um, the majority of my role is helping people that come in the lab, bring their ideas to life. And I mentioned prototyping, I do a lot of that. So I have a couple pictures that I'm gonna share. Um, this is a really great example of prototyping or iterating and starting with something as simple as Play-Doh. So down on the bottom left-hand corner, you can see we have a bottle of propofol and some Play-Doh. And this is Crystal, one of our OR nurses. And her idea was, um, how do I help protect myself as a frontline clinician who's preparing to draw sterile solutions in the operating room? So she's holding the vial and then the proceduralist is coming at me with a needle. And you know, I stay still and he comes at me with the needle. We're all kind of familiar with how I have to stay sterile. So going through the iteration process, we started with Play-Doh to get a design, and then we used another material called polyplastics and created another um, prototype here, and then moved on to 3D printing. And you can kind of see here um, one of our iterations. This is in our final iteration, but going through the process of, well, what are the materials available to me? And how do I even bring my idea to, to fruition as far as being able to talk, talk about it? Um, we do some stuff with electronics. So this is Kelsey, one of our nurses, and she had an idea about packing up with um, fully catheter bags specifically for a Kelly irrigation patient. And her complaint was, how do I um, know when my bag is getting full outside of just walking by the room and knowing? So we worked with some sensors, took it up to a bed, um, just kind of doing some experimentation in and outside of the lab. So I get in and out of the lab doing some projects. I get to work with patients, which is pretty incredible. This device is for um, a recently um, new spinal cord patient that was paralyzed and wanted to be able to put on her makeup again. And one of our first prototypes here was um, a 3D printed piece of some Velcro and Subaru and a bolt so she could put on her mascara again. So that's pretty great, get up to patient room sometimes. We do a lot of micro feedback loops. One of the perks of my role specifically being in the hospital we get to build something in the lab and then take it out to where it might be used and then go back into the lab and iterate on that. Um, and so the, the clinicians that are, have these ideas get to do that work. So you can see we're kind of dispersed. This happens to be a COVID heavy slide, but when we were working on safe transportation of patients, um, a lot of experimentation and then also engagement, You know, bringing in any hospital team member really, whether that be nurses, lab techs, maintenance, you know, engaging in the process of health making is something that we really pride ourselves on doing. And so a lot of my day is very different and every day is very different, but these are some of the things I get to do. I think this is super awesome. And I'm always tapping at you guys' doors. Like, how can we collaborate? How can we get more nurses into this space? So. Um, my question um, to you both is, um, why do you all feel that it's critical for nurses to lead in health-making projects and um, have health-making skills? I 
I know this might be a more of a maker health question, but I actually can speak to that a little bit, um, just based on the conversation Ann and I had last week. Um, nurses know the problems and we know the answers. Um, we often don't have an, we think we don't have an engineering mind, but we actually kind of do because we come up with these solutions. Um, we just don't have the skill set to actually assist us um, to develop these devices that we can think we think of in our head or we actually even create and are just um, using on our own to help solve um, common problems that we have. Um, I spoke to Anna last week um, in academia here at Purdue. We do have a biomedical um, engineering department. And oftentimes those students will come to the nursing faculty to ask questions. And they'll send these emails, emails out to us. I'm, hi, I'm whatever. I'm a junior student in the biomedical engineering. I have questions because you have an expertise in X, Y, and Z. And um, we always love meeting with these students. But we, we meet with the students. We give them the ideas. And we never hear back from them. So um, where does that leave us as nurses? They go off and they run with the, our idea. Why aren't we the ones creating the ideas alongside with them, right? Why aren't we give, giving ourselves the credit as nurses? Um, the thing that attracted me to um, Maker Health was the fact that it's open access. And um, that was the big drive for me is I, 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 if I have an idea, I want it to benefit patients. And um, I don't care if I, you know, I don't, I want, I don't want to get rich off of something that can help um, people throughout the world. That's my answer. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll, I'll be brief, but I think a lot of what we do in nursing and assessing and planning and the nursing process, I'm sure you guys have heard this before, is so very, very much similar to the design process. And we truly do make things for our patients every single day. And I think it's powerful for us to have the tools and materials and then and the, just the exposure to things so that we can tackle these challenges differently. You know, Take that workaround to somewhere safe so we can actually make it into a usable product and then share it across our profession. That's, that's really why I think we need to know. I'm gonna unmute myself. Uh, <laughs> so Rose and Julian, you guys both have, I mean, clearly like learning similar things, but have extremely different paths to kind of experiencing this and getting there. Um, for everybody who's joined tonight to kind of listen and learn, can you share what, what the first step was? So if people are thinking, if they're like, I have an idea, I've done this before, what is the first step? For me, for me, the first step was just um, just considering the fact that I have had an idea, and you know, putting it on paper for me was the biggest was the first step for me. What, you know, that first drawing that I showed you, um, mm -hmm. that was my initial idea, um, and I think. I think we oftentimes keep those ideas in our head and we never we never move forward with them. Um, so I think it's just being confident enough to be able to put that somewhere. It's almost like saying, it's like we, we talk about saying things out loud, like affirmations, um, saying them out loud, because oftentimes that's what you know makes you a better person, whether you're struggling with different things from day-to-day -day things to wait to all kinds of things. And if you put those affirmations out there, oftentimes it's said and it's out in the universe. Well, that's what we need to do with these ideas is we need to put them somewhere whether we bring them out verbally in a drawing i think that's the first step and then and then obviously partnering with people like yourself and who's an engineer to help help us develop these ideas yeah i love I that I'm sorry anna go ahead <laughs> no no i just had never heard um sketching compared to affirmations in that way but it is it's it's that's a really powerful way to um to think about moving these ideas forward yeah and i think i'll just go from the perspective of i wanted to create a space for the nurses that i work with to bring their ideas forward 
I've had projects myself, but I think um, my first step in bringing something like this to my healthcare system was just shooting my shot. You know, you've heard that language. I, I, I sent an email and, and just asked and, and hoped for the best and it, it worked out. I asked the question. And I think that was the start for me. Is this something? How can we make this happen? I love all of those phrases that you said, Rose, shooting your shot, making it happen, um, and just having the opportunity to freely create and think outside the box, which I think is why I love having conversations with you all. And I know I'm like, can we just have a meeting at brainstorming? And you guys are like, Danielle, um, enough. But I think um, it's important to foster creativity because that's how we can stay innovative and um, meet our patients' needs uh, where they are and with what environments they're living within. And I can appreciate that we all have our jack-of-all-trades and MacGyver-esque skills. Um, so my question is, um, how do you feel that healthcare systems and um, nursing schools can foster more of this culture of hands-on innovation? I, I, I can start it. Um, sorry, Rose, if you, if, just tell me to shut up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I work being in academia, I think um, maker, maker health um, in, in of itself. I mean, I'm even thinking of things just sitting here. I'm like, why, why don't we have a maker health lab in every nursing program across the nation? Um, I never, I didn't know about these maker health labs um, that exist in hospital settings uh, for the longest time. Um, I kind of briefly read about, um, I think the lab in Iowa and then Nick was talking to me about, is that the one that you belong to Rose? Is it Iowa? Yeah. Um, then Nick, um, while working with prototypes, he, he was like, I'm gonna ask the, my friends in Iowa at the, at the hospital and I'm like, Holy cow, there, this hospital has this space that I wish, you know, not only in nursing programs, but what, what you know, what about these big, huge uh, facilities? Why, why don't they, why aren't they investing in these um, labs where all types of um, healthcare professionals can come and actually bring their, their ideas to life that's going to help, um, help possibly millions of people. Um, so, I mean, I think I think academia needs to start looking at, at partnerships and um, what are the things that they can do, can they do to help improve healthcare? Cause we, we talk about it and that's the biggest problem is we just talk about it, but like, this is putting your uh, money, you know, <laughs> money where your mouth is or mouth, whatever the, the saying is, I'm not good with sayings. Um, but um, you know, you know, this is where the rubber hit, you know, hits the road. I was going to say, this is definitely a great Anna question, but I think that um, as far as the why, you're, I mean, you're investing, you're investing in your people. When you provide them the space to be able to really feel valued and engaged in their work, you are investing in your people. And I think now more than ever, we really need to get creative on how we're keeping our nurses at the bedside and whether that's teaching them as they're going through nursing school with these prototyping tools or having a space or providing them that outlet in the hospital that they work at. Um, that's definitely, of course, on my radar, but I think everybody needs to be able to have this ability because engaging your nurses and helping them really practice to the top of their license and, you know, just have their ideas come to fruition is just incredible. So I, I hope it catches on more quickly. We're getting there. I, I mean, what we like to think of this as is imagine, you know, like 10 or 15 years ago, like what did, what did nursing informatics look like? Was it even a field? Was it a position? Like, I think what we, in our, in our healthcare future, like every hospital will have a nurse with a position like Rose's and there will be an entire research line of nursing faculty who are able to pursue 
the creation of technology as part of nursing research. And there will be courses where students will learn this and they'll know that when I learn how to use a 3D printer, it's because the hospital that I'm going to work in has one in their, in their supply closet because we're making, you know, we're, 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 we're not just hacking the bandages that we have at hand, but we're actually thinking about what is the personal, what is the personal device that I can create just in time. And so that's, um, it's, it's, it feels like there's all parts of, of healthcare and education that, that are really starting to take this on. And, um, and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to see that come to life. So I have a I have a, a different type of question. Uh, can you guys share? So part of what we talked about was experiments and trying things. Can you guys share an experiment you had that didn't work? And what did you learn from it? I'm in the early phases of prototyping, but I think eventually once I actually get a catheter to work with, I think there's going to be a lot of um, trial and error kind of things. Um, and, I, and I'm just thinking in my mind, the my, my biggest barrier was taking these, and I, I consider myself very creative. Um, I like to draw, I like to do um, artsy stuff when Nick sent me all this stuff, I didn't know what to do with it. I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, am I supposed to pretend? And then I did, that's what I did. I'm like, I'm going to take my back, myself back to my childhood and I'm going to think of what could I use this little thing for? In my head, I envision what it should look like, but this is what I have and this is what I'm going to pretend it, it does. And that's kind of what how I, I moved forward with it. But I think with time, I will have more opportunity for trial and error. One of the biggest things was that 3M device that he sent me. Obviously, it, it's pretty um, it's pretty slick. So anything that you put in it's going to pass back and forth very easily. Um, and I you know I tried a, putting in a, a little piece of tubing in there and pulling it and. Um, it popped off, hit me in the head, but it was okay. You know, I'm like, this isn't going to work. Um, and I'm sure Rose has tons of stories of trial and error. So I'll let her. Oh gosh. I, um, yes. So we opened in the fall of 2019. So I've had a, a couple projects, <laughs> but I would say, um, my trial and error, some of the best things and some of the best things that I've learned have been about different materials and that um, if this solution doesn't work, there's, there's going to be an alternative and we'll get there eventually. Um, a lot of the times, you know, you, oh, you, you might run into uh, right away, let's, let's 3D print it. And then you get to the point of, oh, it needs to be skin safe or it needs to be, you know, like I need to be able to put that in my mouth. Oh, well, the material we used didn't work or, you know, things like that. But I think it's just um, recognizing that it's not really failing. I almost wish that we wouldn't call it failing. I wish that, you know, it's, it's at, I don't know, version one, version two, version three, whatever you want to get to, it's not really failing. You're just learning on the way. Like this material didn't work. I'm going to go on to the next one, right? I'd say that that's kind of the best things that I've learned. Awesome. I like the version versus failure. <laughs> Opportunities for improvement. Absolutely. Um, so um, we're getting kind of at the close of the evening, but I also want to ask one more question and then open up uh, the for the audience to ask any questions. But um, what message would you like to share with nurses that are interested in getting started in an innovation project? My advice is do it. I mean, don't think that your idea is something that is silly, stupid, whatever you want, you know, whatever the, those negative things that go through your head, just, just do it. Um, like I said, I, I was very hesitant at first. And when I got received the, just a package of material, I was like, okay, I just, I, I, I know what I want. 
and this is what I have to work with and I'm going to work with it. And eventually I'm going to trust that Nick, because I've been working solely with Nick, that Nick's going to lead me in the right direction. And um, when he and I speak, um, we often do um, uh, like Zoom like sessions. And it's when talking to him that a lot of even more ideas come to my head. So um, it's just great to partner with someone because then he also has ideas and he's like, have you thought of this? And um, then I explain to him, well, clinically that probably wouldn't work or this or that. So, you know, it's having that partnership. So I, I say, just, just do it. If you, th if you really think that you can um, make a difference specifically to creating devices, similar to what Rose has, has shown pictures of something that I'm trying, you know, thing that I'm trying to do, um, give it, give it a try. Um, that, that's all I, that's my advice. Yeah, I will echo exactly what you said. Shoot your shot, try it, right? Um, and the, one of the best things that I've learned along the way is um, my husband's not in healthcare. So I'll be like, oh, you know, we were working on da, da, da. And he'll be like, well, why'd you do it that way? And I'll be like, well, because, because, right? So um, asking people who are outside of either your specialty of nursing or outside of even the world of healthcare, ask some of the best questions and make you kind of pivot a little bit and like, oh, well, yeah, I guess it would be important to, you know, fill in the blank, but that's kind of the best advice I have. Just start, draw it out on paper, build it out of duct tape and cardboard. Maybe it's something virtual, but yeah, just start. Awesome. Um, so I've been, there have been some great questions coming in in the chat and I've been trying to field some quick answers to them. Um, so I'll, uh, so you guys can follow along in there to kind of see a little bit more detail, but I'll, Ladon, I'll just speak to your question that, that you just posted um, about how intellectual property of the idea and finished product is handled. So we, um, the, the, the idea is this is your idea. So we, Maker Health, does not own any intellectual property, um, What, and nor do we with the hospital programs as well. Like our business model is on bringing these programs. We have software that we've built. So we have a licensing fee to both institutions to use this and through the academy program uh, for individuals um, and learning content that we're building or we're teaching this. But the intellectual property is yours. So what... Julian mentioned and Rose um, mentioned some of this as well as that many of the projects that we support uh, for the creators, they um, the path to bringing to bringing this to patients into impact is not necessarily through the intellectual property, um, either because maybe there's like a patent is not possible, there's not the budget for it, or there's just other ways to reach more uh, patients that allow you to create a more interesting model. So for example, like we support a lot of clinicians who they may not be creating a product, but what they are investing in is themselves and their expertise and becoming a domain expert by creating these prototypes. So then instead of, of working on what is my business model to license its product, it is, what is my business model for me to, to make myself an expert in, in this process, in this technology, so I can teach others, I can publish papers, I can become an expert and get paid for my perspective and expertise in this. Um, so that's part of as like the academy process is we work with the individual clinicians on what is your what is your impact that you want this project to have? And there are a lot of different strategies and tools that you can use. So that was a longer answer than you might have been been thinking about, but um, but it's a great question. Are there any other questions in the audience? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Got a quiet uh, crew tonight, but there is one more question that maybe we can ask, Anna. Um, the last one, you think? Yeah, which part of it? I, there's like a twofer. 
<laughs> all of it. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> okay. Um, what is a what is an untapped area in healthcare or nursing for health making? Could be a specialty, or it could just be the place within the system, the field. I feel like in the ICU, there's tons of opportunity for health making. I mean, especially we saw a lot of that come out of COVID with the IV pumps and the you know extension tubing so that the pumps can be outside the room. Um, even with the ventilators, but granted, this was technology. We had invested in ventilators where you could take the the um, the face off so that it was remotely we could remotely change fence settings outside the room mm. um, and even just the way nurses were able to reuse the PPE when we were on a PPE shortage and how they constructed it on a Tupperware so that they could preserve the front of it and just put it on their faces and um, so I think ICU we have a ton of MacGyvers there as well but also untapped. I feel like if we had a maker health lab in the ICUs, like it would be bobbing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you also have, I think the ICU is interesting because, you know, the ED has that same sense of emergency, but in the ICU, you're, you're there with patients for long periods of time. The ED is, is like quick MacGyver moments when you need it and move patients through in the ICU is like, this is a big challenge that we're gonna have for quite a while. So it's like different styles of, of making and thinking about making. Anesthesia gonna, wires. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, need, we need to tap into something there. I hear you. Um, I was gonna say peds. I, every time that I happen to end up over in peds, and I'm going to uh, tap into Julian's kind of response of what am I supposed to do? Play? Pretend? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but think about their pa patient populations and how they kind of just have to adapt with even the mood of the child as you're entering the room. I haven't spent a lot of time there, but I bet that we have some hidden makers hanging out in peds. I think another area that, that um, there's a lot of people who, um, develop or have ideas are in the rehab areas. I think mm -hmm. Rose sh showed an example of that with the makeup, you know, the little makeup thing that they was developed for the late young lady that was, you know, paralyzed. I think rehab's a great, another un unta untapped, and I think they use a lot of, of MacGyver stuff <laughs> to try to help their patients. Yeah, and it's almost, that's an interesting area too, because even you're like bridging inpatient and outpatient, right? Like if you're making things for patients who are, who are going to go home, then you've got a level of like education, like user education that right. as a maker, you have to keep in mind that's really distinct from how an ICU clinician would approach making. I'd like a better dispenser for gloves so that we don't waste when we try to grab one, like four comes out and they all like fall on the floor and those are wasted. And when we think about um, how we were short PPE in mm -hmm. at the height of the pandemic and how many gloves we wasted in a day. I want a better dispenser that only pops out the two that you need. We actually, Janice, I could... Um can't pull it up this quickly, but I'll figure out, I will share it with Danielle so she can share it with you all. But we saw, we had somebody making early prototypes of this that I think could be really great to iterate on. And this was years ago. This was before, it was before probably two or three years before COVID, which feels really like 15 years ago. <laughs> um, but where, so for the dispensers that are on a wall, right? So you have the small, medium, large size gloves. They took a plastic sheet. So imagine like a rigid plastic sheet and they cut holes that in the face of that, that it would sit over the boxes of gloves. So just by decreasing the size of the hole in the box, it would catch a lot of the ones that, um, 
they were otherwise because the, the cardboard boxes like those boxes have enormous holes it's like you just an open face box um so i've got a i've got an early stage prototype for you if you'd like to to work with us on iterating on that because i'm sure there's a lot of hospitals who would be really interested in in that now I feel like the OR, not that it needs to be a maker space, but the amount of waste, wasted mm. materials could be used to supply the maker labs in the hospital because um, we would have, back in my undergraduate school, an OR nurse would collect all the waste, but they would be like either unopened or materials mm -hmm. that could be reused, but not reused for surgery. And she would just ship it to third world countries for them to supply their hospitals. And it was like tons and tons of stuff that it was like, oh, this touched the table, can't use this whole kit. And it was just like, man, we could use mm -hmm. that extra Foley and give it to Julian yeah. for his <laughs> prototyping. <laughs> It was insane. So I think collaborating with ORs to get some of their clean waste to supply some of the, the maker spaces might be a good idea. It's an amazing idea. Giving the waste to the guy, giving that a second life. I know um, my background is in clinical education and we often got tons of OR waste for training and um, cause we go through lots of supplies and have to create uh, innovation just to have like some live experiences for the staff to train. Mm -hmm. So that's possibly an untapped area too. Cause that's educators are very idea. creative. And when we're doing STEM, we try to get as real as possible. And, and we, we create all kinds of <laughs> things to simulate what's happening at the bedside. That is awesome. I have a great story that just came to mind that I have to share. We actually hacked a simulation mannequin um, and there's this um, intubation technique called SALAD and I'm going to get the acronym wrong, but it's like suction assisted laryngoscopy something device. Anyway, um, it's the idea that you're you're basically using a type of Yankar while you're intubating because somebody might be having like an, a ruptured esophageal varicity or they might be actively vomiting, but how do you safely get in the lungs and not have all that fluid go in? Mm -hmm. So we we hacked the mannequin and made it vomit with a like a drill <laughs> motor and it's a really great project. And now our um, our flight helicopter um, nurses actually use that as a tool and um, use that with our area EMS. So yeah, mm -hmm. there's absolutely a place for all sorts of simulation things and being able to um, create better products, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Awesome. Are there any last minute questions? We have three minutes remaining. All right, well, if there's nothing else, um, and if you could just close out, just kind of share how, if people are interested in getting involved. Oh, did you have something to share? You know what? I was just going to find the link for Academy. <laughs> oh, yes. Please share the Academy and be sure to follow them on social media as well. Um, we can put that information in the chat and then yes. uh, also send it out um, in our email blasts. Okay. Um, so this, so I mentioned I responded um, to one of the questions that asked about the the cost for the program. So the so it is a uh, Maker Health Academy is the program that uh, we're working with Julian through, and that typically has a membership fee, but the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has sponsored uh, spots for nurses who are working on challenges that address. Um, health equity. So how do we improve health equity and in, in using technology, using creating and making. Um, so I'm going to put the application in here um, and take a look at this. And again, even if you don't have a scoped technology that you want to create, if you have a challenge that you want to solve, um, please at a minimum, fill out the form with your email address and, and just some, some quick answers. Um, can nursing students apply? Yes. 
yeah, send, send in your application and let's talk. Um, we really, you know, the goal is to, to get a device that impacts patient care, that changes patient care. Um, and so we would love, we'd love to have a conversation um, with you about, about your idea and what you want to work on. Um, so take a look at, uh, yeah, social channels there. Um, I'm going to throw my email address in there as well. That's a quick way to even get a gut check on your idea. Um, and we hope to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you all for coming out. Um, this is a series of Nurses Week events. We hope that you can come out tomorrow for our event that starts at 7 p.m. What's your stress management blueprint? And then um, on the 11th, we'll be having a wonderful panel discussion around diversity and inclusion or tokens, a Q&A discussion with Dr. Ketchy and colleagues. So thank you all for coming out and have a wonderful night.